Hi, David. Hi, how you doing? Welcome to The Circle. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, David, CEO and Creative Director of David August, Luxury Men's Custom Tailoring and Celebrity Clothier. Sounds so <laughs> It is so. <laughs> it's your life, man. Thank you. I love it. I know we were trying to figure out how we know each other because I always like to, um, you know, brag about my cool friends, but... We really, we can, neither one of us can remember. Well, that's because we've been friends for so long. Yeah, I think it's been about 15 years. That's right. Um, I know it was pre-second group of kids. <laughs> I think you only had one daughter when I first yes, met one, you. Yes, one, four. And, um, but we really got to know each other on our trip to Cuba. That's right. Uh, oh my gosh, which I almost didn't make. You almost didn't remember make. Remember, because I'd lost my, uh, so had my bag stolen the night yeah, before. Yeah, no, it's a crazy story. We had, to, it was at... Uh, 133 Prime, or what's that restaurant right. called? I think, is it 184 Prime? One, One, something yeah, Prime. Prime. 122 in, or something. In, uh, in, in uh, uh, Miami. Miami Beach, yeah. yeah. And uh, you had your you had your bag stolen. That's right. And it, it had your passport in part. it. It had everything in it. Yeah. I had a bunch of cash in there, my passport, my wallet, my telephone. Everything was in that. And we thought you weren't going to go. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you did an OJ Simpson across the airport. That's right. I guess they had called they you. Called Somebody found your bag. They called me from the uh, Fountain Blue Hotel, and they said, um, is your is this David? I actually had my my phone was on me. I had a burner phone in the you know for Cuba. They said you can't take your other phone, mm -hmm. so I had that in the thing. So I had my phone on me, and that's all I had, nothing else. And so they called me. I was on my way to the airport to tell you guys, hey, listen, I really can't go. You know, it's really yeah. early in the morning. Yeah. And they called me from the Found Blue security office and said, hi, is this David Heil? And I said yes. And they said, well, are you missing anything? I said, I'm missing my bag. And they said, well, we have your bag at the security office at the Fountain Blue. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. turn it around to the driver. And he went back and there it was. Everything was in there except for the cash. I mean, I literally think you were diving onto the plane as the I doors was. were shut. You guys were like pulling me through security. <laughs> go, come on, come on, come on. let's go. I think yeah. I did. You guys supported me because I didn't have, I had, I had no cash on me. Yeah. And so everybody was paying for me. It was a That was trip. an awesome trip. That was yeah. so much was fun, fun, right? Oh my gosh, all the art. Well, yeah, amazing. well, we got to go before it opened up. We went on a special cultural VIP excursion, and yeah. um, you actually made a suit for the president. The president, of Cuba. remember he was at dinner and we measured him yeah, in the kitchen. Yeah, we did. I got. I just looked at those pictures the other day. He's he was wearing my jacket, posing. <laughs> it was great. That was an amazing trip. I, yeah. I just have so many incredible highlights of that trip. But we digress. You have been an entrepreneur in men's luxury tailoring for over 30 years. Um, as I hate saying that. That sounds like I'm so old. I always tell my employees when they start telling how long you've been doing this. I say, um, you know, just say over 20 years. <laughs> because once you get to 30, it's like, well, that guy's old. I started when I was four, I promise. That's right. Uh, and you work specifically um, creating custom wardrobes for top professionals in business, entertainment, professional sports. Of course, I have to do a little bit of name dropping here because you have a long list of clients, some of the best of the best. Um, Elon Musk, Tony Robbins, Bill Clinton, Warren Buffett, Conor McGregor, Clint Eastwood, Will Smith, Kobe Bryant. I, yeah, yeah, man. Just hearing those names, I mean, even yourself, you must go, wow, I really made an impact here. Very, very, very thankful and very fortunate. But, uh, you know, and I've been really blessed. And so I'm very happy about that. Do you have any um, favorites? I mean, it's hard to like, it's like picking your favorite kids, but. Oh my gosh, I have a lot of favorites. I, you know, I get asked that all the time, but I, it's kind of a hard question to answer because all my clients are kind of my friends. Yeah. My friends are my clients. And so mm -hmm. I travel with them. We get to know them. We got to dinner with them. And so they're kind of all my favorites. There's a couple of people, you know, I'm not going to mention names, but that I've had to fire over the years. Yeah. But, uh, it's just, you kind of. Um, attract like people yeah. in your business. And so, in, and I'm in the people business. It's a, it's a lifestyle business. And so if they don't work within your, you know, the way you do your business, they kind of work themselves out, not, you know, in a bad way. Right. They just, you know, don't end up being a long-term client. And these guys that you mentioned are all really long-term clients. Yeah. I know you've been working with Tony Robbins for like over 30 years. Wow. Incredible. Actually, I just had, there's a quick funny segue story. I had, um, Connor McGregor, Tony wanted to meet Connor. And so he wanted to have him on at his, um, uh, at his house. He has a small group of people he works with, like 60 of his platinum partners. And so he had him at the house. He has this big weekend every year. And so he has special guests. He had like, you know, um, 
uh, Mike Tyson and uh, uh, he wanted, he likes people that are athletes and stuff. Mm, he was Mayweather there? there? May, he has, he's had Mayweather. He's yeah. had uh, different times. Um, but anyway, he has all these different people on every year. He has three people over the weekend and he wanted, really wanted to have Conor McGregor. And so I asked Conor and Conor's like, well, I don't know, maybe. And I said, Conor would be good for you too because Conor's known to, you know, he can get out there and, and he can get things. There's always something going on with Conor. Mm. And you love him or you hate him, but you still like to watch him. Yeah. And so I introduced him to Tony and um, he said, I'm going to only go if you go. And so I went down there and we were talking and a little bit and Conor was on the show with Tony and Tony was saying, hey, listen, I've been, um, Conor says, uh, um, so we have a mutual person that we, that we work with, David from David August. And, and uh, Conor uh, says, yeah, you've been working with him for, um, like 25 years, right? And, and Tony says, no, like 35 years. <laughs> and so, and I, so it goes by fast. I had no idea it was that long, but yeah, yeah a long time. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, you got to tell me, what's it like working with Elon Musk? It is, it's great, actually. You know, we don't do a lot for him. We do, um, uh, I've done several outfits for him, but he is this very deep thinker and you'll be in a fitting with him. <clears throat> and he will just kind of fade off from what's at hand going on with us. Mm -hmm. And in his own mind, he'll walk over to the window and say, wow, it's a beautiful day today. And then kind of fade back in. He's yeah. just, but he is so, there's one story I had with him that when I was at his house for the first time, pulled into the carport and he had these um, uh, four Teslas back into the open garages, right? There's, they're backed in, they're all different color. A red one, a black one, a gray one and whatever. And so, when I was talking to him, I said, so which color is your favorite color of those cars in the garage? And he said, the one that's charged. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that was a stupid question. <laughs> the one that's True story. Charged. I was like, what? It was a good question. question. It was a stupid yeah. answer. <laughs> uh, so I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. But yeah, he's a great guy. And he's, you know, everybody... He's a very, very interesting guy. Now, is it true that you guys did a, a suit lining with little rockets on it? Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We've done a lot. And our suit linings are pretty, they've become very, very popular. And Yeah. What was Conor McGregor's for the fight? He had a, well, an interesting liner, it's, it's, right? I brought you something and I'll give it to you in a few minutes. Okay. Here, but um, we, I did a suit for him that had F you in the mm -hmm. um, written in the pinstripes. It was actually woven into the pinstripe. Wow. It, it was the pinstripe. Yeah. Repeated over and over in Navy with a gray pinstripe. <clears throat> and he wore that um, on stage. What happened was I, he was having his first of those four pre-fight press conferences. And there, one was at Staples Center in LA. Next one was in Toronto. Next one was in New York City. The next one was in London with he and Mayweather. And so the very first, um, uh, press conference at Staples, he had, um, we had four suits ready for him for the tour. And I showed up at this hotel room at the Ritz Carlton in LA and I brought out the four suits and he was very excited about all the suits. There are all these plaids and fun stuff that he normally wears. And I popped out this last suit and I said, oh, you can wear this suit. And he goes, ah, oh, that's just a pinstripe suit. And I said, no, look closely. And he looked and he says, give me that suit. <laughs> and so we put that on him and, and we decided, hey, you got to wear it. When should I wear it? We said, you got to wear it today. Yeah. So he wore it and he walked out on stage and he said, I mean, you can look at it online. It's like, yeah. Everywhere. And um, he said, how do I look? I think I look pretty effing good. And, yeah. And he says, if you read my pinstripes, it says exactly how I feel about Mayweather. Yeah. And so the camera zoomed in. People mm -hmm. kind of giggled a little bit. And then the camera zoomed in. And then on the jumbo trying came up. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, wow. We're in trouble here. And the place went crazy. And that went viral. Yeah. We had over 6 billion, not million, 6 billion impressions on the internet on that. I saw it. Yeah. I mean, and young people, older people, it's just amazing. It still lives on today. People all know that suit. Yeah. Pretty crazy. That's an awesome story. Love yeah, it. It's fun. Okay, so Kobe Bryant. You got to say a little bit about our boy, our homeboy. Kobe. Woo, that's a tough one. You know, I've been working with Kobe. I worked with him since his rookie season. And uh, he's been an amazing friend, client. But uh, he's he was just this, you know, bigger than life guy that, was very, you know, quiet, but also opinionated and um, an amazing athlete, you know, if not the best, one of the best in the, in the history of basketball and, you know, a great family guy and great children and, you know, just bigger in life. And so, um, and he wasn't really, he was, he was, he really 
didn't get involved in picking out his clothing. He just said, that's your job. Wow. And so I always picked everything out for him. And then he had a stylist in, um, in his last year and then after he retired and they came back to me and they and I worked through his stylist, which, mm-hmm. which is um, Victoria Trilling from um, Fox um, Sports. She does all the Fox Sports people and she's amazing. Oh, wow. And so I worked with her and that was a great relationship too with Kobe. Anyway, and now um, it's just horrific. Sad, sad very, loss yeah, for sure. Very sad. What a great guy. Um, do you ever get starstruck? You know. Or who has been the one that you've been most like – Wow, and awe of. I actually like business guys. Yeah. You know, I like, I'm more of a, you know, like Frank Geary is a great, great friend and client of mine. I'm like, I, he's just an amazing guy. He's the most, I, I feel, and I think a lot of other uh, people feel that he's the most important living architect in, on the planet. Mm-hmm. And he's just this great, genuine, amazing guy. And uh, I really like that. But I have a, you know, when I used to be starstruck, and I used to be kind of like, Starstruck over athletes because I was like, oh, wow, I'm a big sports fan. Mm -hmm. And then uh, entertainment, yeah, a little bit. And I had one day um, Frank Geary actually called me and said, hey, listen, I was in in Germany for my 90th birthday. And they had this big party for me in Germany. And he was in Munich. I didn't go to the party, but he was – we made him a suit for the party. And he said, Brad Pitt was – at the party and came up to me and said, Frank, happy birthday. And, you know, but more important than that, where did you get that suit? <laughs> and so I made him a suit with this, all the linings and the lining inside the suit were pictures of a bunch of his buildings. It oh was amazing. It was beautiful. Anyway. Wow. So uh, he told me, so I've got this guy in LA that makes my clothing for me. And he told him anyway. So fast forward about a month or so later, we get this phone call from this some, somebody in LA and they said, Hey, we understand you're in Orange County. Do you go up to LA at all? My boss wants to have some suits made. Okay, great. Who is it? Well, I can't really tell you, but just, you know, it's kind of private and maybe you could show up and we, so we booked the appointment. That happens actually quite often in our, in our business. People don't like to say up front who they're we're, we're dealing with. Oh, we're interesting. Dealing with a lot of people. Anyway, so we don't really make Do they that know that you're probably more famous than them? <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> not going to really tell you who I am <laughs> until I show up anyway. So, we went up to, and they said, just, you know, come through the gate, say your name to the gate, we'll bring you in through the gate, go to the fourth house on the right, and someone will be able to greet you, bring inside. So anyway, I walked in and um, sitting in this, like a flat type of a space, one of the buildings on the, in the compound. And uh, he'll be out here in a minute. Okay, great. I'm waiting there. And here comes Brad Pitt, walks out. And he goes, hey, David, how are you doing? Thanks for coming up. And I said, hey, Brad, how are you doing? Anyway, so that was pretty cool because- yeah. I mean, you know, we've watched him for so long and he's a right. cool guy and he ends up being the nicest, nicest guy. He seems like he would be. He's just a nice guy and very genuine, um, you know, just a really great guy. I think that's most of my clients are are just really, um, they're appreciative. And that's what I like yeah. about dealing with these people. Some people, you know, I think it, and the, the more successful they are, you get to a point, you're trying to make it and you have a little bit of an attitude at times and whatever happens through that growth period. And when you get to a certain level, you kind of go back to being a normal guy again. Yeah. And well, and he got yeah. 50% custody as of yesterday. That's right. So. Congratulations, Brad. Uh, yay. Excellent. His kids like him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so how do you get, is most of your business on referral? Or? It's only referral. Because I don't think I've ever seen an advertisement yeah. for you. It's only referral. And what happens um, with the people that we deal with, most of the people have just, had a, a big event in their life where they sold their company mm-hmm. or they're doing very well financially and the success is, you know, they've been there for a while. And so we're not the cheapest guy in town. I'm not the most expensive, but we're on the higher end. And and so when they get to a point where they can afford us, they're already pretty successful. Mm-hmm. And they probably already have a whole wardrobe full of clothing. And they probably are saying, I never want to wear a suit again. I'm just selling my company. It's the last thing I want to do. And that's not what we're about anyway, but they don't know that. So they think mm-hmm. when they get referred to me that, oh, this guy's going to come in and sell them a bunch of clothing. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we're about. We are just kind of a lifestyle company, which we, whatever your, your lifestyle is, we kind of adapt to that for you. Yeah. Anyway, so we usually get referred. They usually say, no, that's cool. I'm fine. Thank you. Because nobody ever wants to meet somebody new. 
That's just how it is. People are like, ah, you got your car detail guy, you got your doctor, you got your attorney, you got your tax guy. <laughs> you just stick got, with them. You got your guy. And people are creatures of habit. They just want to stick with it. And they don't ever, uh, you get to a point in life where you're like, oh, that's the last person I want to meet. So that's what we get that response. And then after they get, re, they get um, referred numerous times, three, four, five times, it becomes kind of like a mercy appointment. Like, okay, let's just have the guy come in yeah. so I can tell my friends to leave me alone, get him in here for five minutes. We'll say hi. We'll get rid of this guy and we'll be done. And so I show up, we start talking, and I start explaining to them that they don't need a lot of clothing in their closet anymore. They don't need a bunch of suits. What you need is four or five great outfits that overlap to from business, formal business, semi-formal, casual, and then you, fit, you know, feed in some accessories, and that's all you really need. And they're like, oh, great. They become clients, they love it, and we become friends, and that's just kind of how it works. And so, yeah, it's all referral. One of my favorite things that you do are the men's polo shirts. Those are yeah, absolutely spectacular. Thank you. Every man should have that in their, in their wardrobe. You know, I love our polo shirts. We have the best polo shirt on the planet. Yeah, and, 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 and when we say polo shirt, for people who don't know, don't think of your traditional polo no, shirt because it, no. the, the fabrication is so beautiful and thank hangs you. on a man's body, shows off his yeah. features so well. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, they're great. They're a moisturized cotton, stand-up collar. They're different from a classic polo shirt. You think it's like a golf shirt. Yeah. It's, um, and, and, and I've and seen the, the ones with the, the sewn-in epaulets. Epaulets. I've tried to do those on my t-shirts. So, and so spectacular. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we have them in 26 it. colors now. Guys, come get them. Wow. Great. We carry, it's just a very popular item for us, and it's um, a, a really great basic staple for us. Yeah. I love men's clothing. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but my first jobs were in men's clothing. Oh. I worked for GHQ. Do you oh, remember yeah, GHQ? Yeah, of so I worked for the one in the Beverly Center. So I got great. to work with celebrities too. See? I worked with Bruce Springsteen. I dressed. Bruce is a client of mine. Uh, lucky. Yep. Um, I dressed the guys from Queen. Oh, that's, um, cool. that's when Star Search was on. Oh, so they gosh. used to send all their uh, people in. Um, so I got to work with a lot. And men are awesome to work with because they actually genuinely want your help. Yep. I, I worked briefly in a, in a woman's. Um, store and it was awful. Women were just like, don't, don't talk to me. I don't want your help. Yeah. You know, it was not fun, but men are fun. They actually fun. really appreciate they do, and guidance. They, I say the difference between, because people ask me all the time, you know, I get probably 10, 15, 20 requests a week for doing women's clothing. And we don't really do women's clothing. Mm -hmm. I used to do it, but I decided at one point in my career that you know what? I need to really concentrate on one yeah. of these here, yeah. you know, to get good because I'm still trying to figure out the men's business, you know, but um, anyway, but I think men, what I like about dealing with men is they come in, they have uh, a schedule, they come in, they look at their watch and they say, Hey David, how you doing? I need two suits, two sport coats, four pairs of pants and like a dozen shirts. They look at their watch again. They go, I got to go. Can you just figure that out? And it's really kind of like that wow. after you get to know them as clients. So, and women come in and they go, hi, David, how you doing? What's new today? And then you put stuff on and they, you know, there's, and next time, and they're such different body shapes and everything, yeah. obviously. So you're always trying to recreate things. And then you get them one great outfit. They love it. It's fantastic. And then they want to do something totally different. And then they get home and they go, how does this look on my butt? And how does this, you yeah. know? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a lot more upkeep. I love dealing with women, obviously. It's great. But I'm just, I've decided to concentrate on men's and it's been a really good uh, decision. Okay, so walk us through. So you get a call from uh, Elon or Bill Clinton or somebody fabulous. You show up. W what exactly is the process? Show up, sit down, get to know him a little bit, kind of like this talking and mm -hmm. uh, get to know what, you know, I already kind of know about the client because we do our research. And, yeah. and um, so I kind of know what I'm getting into before I get there most of the time. Um, but you want to get to know the client and get to know what they have in their closets, what their, their real. Do you actually go into their closets and look at what they have or yeah. you just ask them? A lot of times we do. Yeah. At first, at first, a lot of people don't watch you in their closet because they're yeah. not sure it's kind of, it's their yeah. private area. And so, but once you get to know the client and they become, um, more friends, then what you do get in the closet, you can really help them a lot more than you do. You still do a great job with them, obviously, but I think getting in the closet, men are creatures of habit, like I said before, and they keep everything. They don't want to get rid of anything. <laughs> and they have a story about every item of clothing in there. Yeah. They go, ah, I wore that when I graduated from college. And yeah. I love that. I'm going to wear it someday. Anyway, so when you get through the closet, when you do get in the, um, into the closet, you can do a lot more for them. But go back to the um, original question of process. getting to know the person, the process of it. You um, go through your basics, like where do they travel? How often do they travel? Do they do any public speaking? 
Are they at the office? Do they wear suits? Do they wear sport coats? What do they actually wear on a mm-hmm. daily basis? What do they like to wear? And how do they like their clothing to fit? And then we make suggestions. We ask them, already, what do they have in their closet? And they'll tell us, oh, I have, I've got 10 suits. And then I ask the same questions. I ask the same questions, everybody. Okay, so how many suits do you have in your closet? And they usually say, oh, 10 to 25 suits. Okay, great. Next question is, okay, how many of those suits do you actually wear? And they go, oh, probably maybe it's always the same question, but they're the same answer. You could write it now. Yeah. It it's, it's always the same. So, but I'm just kind of going through it. Yeah. And, um, and they say, oh, probably four to six. And I go, okay, great. What do those four to six look like? And they say, oh, it's a um, uh, navies and grays for the most part. And then I say, okay, which of those suits do you feel like a million bucks in? And they say, oh, probably the last one I bought. And I said, okay, great. So for our conversation, we're going to consider you have one suit, the one that you feel like a million bucks in, mm-hmm. because everything in your closet, you should feel great wearing. Yeah. Everything else, you shouldn't even have it. It's not a mm-hmm. money issue at this point. No. It's a value issue. Mm-hmm. And so we try to get them to the point where they're like, okay, they understand that the stuff that's in their closet, even though they have a full closet full of clothing, they have a, whole, a full closet full of nothing to wear. Right. And so you want to get to the point where you have a smaller amount of clothing that you wear the heck out of and that you really appreciate and you get a lot of enjoyment out of and compliments out of. Do you ever of. have to be mean and go, that oh, that is horrible. You should never wear that. Yeah, what, you, mean, what were you thinking? Yeah, you have to be a little brutal at times. <laughs> yeah, you know, where do you get that? And I always tell people there's compliments and there's comments. And I say, right. people think it's the same thing, but it's not. Yeah, right. It's totally different. Wow, that's a beautiful suit. Or, wow, where'd you get that suit? That's, right. that's a comment. Right, not a compliment. Not a compliment. Yeah. The first one's a compliment. You know, or and the best compliment is not, wow, that's a beautiful suit. The best compliment is, wow, that guy always looks great. It's better than picking up the item of clothing. They're looking at the package. Is it is a fashion sense something that you can teach somebody, or is it one of those things that you're either born with or not? I think you're born with it, kind of. I mean, you can mm-hmm. learn, and but I don't think it's like deep in your bones. Yeah. But I think that if you really, you know, if it's if you're born with it, and you. Um, that can mature mm-hmm. even more so, but you you can learn some things about it, but I don't think you have that, you know, deep sense of, I know what I'm doing without asking other people their opinion. Mm. And do you think that most of your clients have a fashion sense or no? No, okay. I don't. I yeah. don't think most of the people have fashion sense. Yeah. I think people want to look good. And I've, I have several clients that are fashion guys and they really, they're really into it mm-hmm. and they look great. They, those guys can make a paper bag look good. Right. Okay, because they put it on the morning, they look in the mirror, their hair is combed properly, they, they you know, got it together, they put their shirt on, they make sure the collar's up, they put their jacket on, make sure it's on straight, and they can wear an inexpensive item of clothing. It looks amazing. Right. Because they've got attitude. They're wearing the clothing. The clothing's not wearing them. And then you get a guy that buys a $10,000 suit and it looks like he slept in it. Right. Do you like vintage clothing? Yeah, I, I it, well, I used to like it a lot. So for some reason, recently, I don't like wearing other people's clothes. Oh, so do, do you only wear I, your I own clothes? I think I'm clothes? overthinking it at times. Do I what? Do you only wear your own brand? No, I wear other brands too, but mostly my brand. What happens is when I go out, I shop around a lot just because I'm interested in seeing yeah. what's out there. And I, I'm always looking at what people are wearing, um, you know, teenagers, what they're wearing, because that's what's going to be their next, I think. And I'm, I'm really interested in that. So um, when I'm out at stores, a lot of times I'll try something on and then I'm very critical of myself at that because I'm like, wow, this fits better than my stuff. (laughs) What the heck? I doubt it. No, I do. And and you get it in your own mind. So I buy it because I want to show my tailors back in the office. Why does ours not have this? You know, why does it fit better? And then what really happens, I was in the moment. And I bought it and I got all excited about it and got, you know, and when I get back to the office and I actually have the time to really look at it, it's really not that great. And our stuff is better. Okay. It really is. Yeah. And, and so that makes it's me It's just feel, some FOMO in the dressing room. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. That's exactly what it is. And I'm like, what's going on here? Anyway, so it, it's, um, we have beautiful clothing. And I also, also always tell my guys in, the, in our team, when you look back at our clientele, the people that are in the limelight or in the, uh, on the red carpets and things that we dress. <clears throat> we have so many people that have, have won the award of best dress for that event. Oh. And it's really, it's really cool. And you look at what they normally wear. Yeah. 
like Robert Downey Jr., for example, yeah. great example. You know, he doesn't, he's not really, doesn't uh, look that great in his clothing, but he's so popular and he just wears his stuff and people like look past the clothing. But if you stop and look at the clothing, it's really not that great. Mm. We put him in, he was um, nominated for a BAFTA award, made him a tuxedo, nominated for an Oscar, made him a tuxedo. And then we got him dressed though. I said, look, I'm going to get you dressed. And so I sent one of my guys up to the red carpet. And I said, when he gets out of the car, put the jacket on him adjust his tie and push him down the runway. Don't let him do it himself. Tie his tie for him, do everything. So um, we did that. And he, um, it was when uh, they had the, the um, what's uh, Joan Rivers and- her, Oh, e, e, e on the red yeah, carpet or whatever. Yeah, uh, whatever that was. Anyway, so they named him Best Dressed. It was with, wow. I guess, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, um, Robert Downey Jr. And one other person, I can't remember who it was, but- drum roll and it was Robert Downey Jr. And like, oh my God, his camp called and we're not going to believe it. We got best dressed. That's so awesome. Cool. He's he's such a cool guy too. Yeah. He must have been fun to work with. He's fun to work with. I met him in London one time. It was, um, and they called me and said he got Entertainer of the Year. And so Entertainment Weekly was doing a photo shoot to have him on the cover. <clears throat> so they asked me to fly to London because he was filming uh, Sherlock Holmes over there. And so I jumped on a plane. I took some stuff with me and I uh, went over to London and I did a photo shoot that day with this him. This why you're never home. Yeah, just go, <laughs> exactly. But, um, and so during the photo shoot, I had all this great clothing for him and he said, whose jacket is that? And I said, well, that's my jacket. And I had a car coat, like mm. a herringbone mm. car coat. <clears throat> and so he goes, let's try that. And so I'm like, okay. So I just put my hair and bone car coat. He went crazy with it. He had this, um, like a, a cane in his hand. He's dancing on this big drum they had him on. Yeah. And he had the car coat on and we had a black shirt with a bow tie tied to it. The collar, he just had the collar up. Yeah. The car coat and he's dancing around. He loved it. And we got done. I took it off. And I was taking his coat and he goes, no, no, no. This is my coat now. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, he's like, what, what, what am I my, supposed to wear in London? That's my coat. <laughs> anyway, no big deal. So I said, you know, it's your gift. I mean, my, my gift to you. Anyway, and so he took it and, um, after I said, let's go to dinner. And he said, oh, I can't go to dinner with you. I'm, I'm on lockdown. I'm going through all my stuff and I got to like stay focused and mm. whatever. He says, but you ought to go to Guy Ritchie's restaurant over here. He's got a pub. Go to dinner and then it's called, whatever it's called, his pub's name there in London. I said, maybe I will. I was just by myself. And so I went to dinner. I was in my taxi. I was driving home. And I told the taxi driver, I go, what's that music playing? And they go, it's, oh, it's Guy Ritchie's pub. And I go, oh, pull over here for a second. And so he said, if he's there, Go say hi to him. And I didn't know what guy, who Guy Ritchie was. I yeah. knew who he was, but I didn't know him. Yeah, what he looks time. like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I walked in this pub, packed people, and I ordered myself like a pint of beer and I'm sitting there, I'm looking Good around. Good London thing to do. Yeah, exactly, right? And so I'm in there and I'm looking around. I'm just hanging out by myself and looking around. I'm looking around, like, Guy Ritchie, Guy Ritchie. And I see these guys in the back of the restaurant in the pub and look like, I, I think that's Guy Ritchie back there with his buddies. So I walked back and I said, I walked up to the table and they're all sitting there and I stand at the table and they look at me kind of weird, like, okay, yeah, buddy. What's yeah. Up? And I said, hi, guy. And he's like, yeah. And I said, my name's David Heil. I said, I'm I'm a friend of Robert Downey Jr.'s. And he said, oh yeah, right. Everybody's a friend of Robert Downey Jr.'s. How, how are you a friend of Robert Downey Jr.? I said, well, I make his clothing. He goes, really? You didn't happen to make him a herringbone car coat. And I said, actually, I did. And he goes, you know what? He goes, I took that from him today. I have it in my house. In my <laughs> the same day. So he went to, he was on the set with the uh, Sherlock Holmes, he wore the jacket and Guy took it from him. What? You crazy? just gave it to him. Yeah. And so I, he goes, sit down. Who are you with? And I said, I'm by myself. So I sat down and I hung out with them all. I had dinner with them. Went to a pub, another bar after with them. Fun. Yeah, crazy. Fun, fun. Anyway, funny. Yay. Robert Downey. Okay, so I do like to hear a little bit about, you know, where you get your original thoughts about clothes. So take us back. Where did you grow up? I grew up in, uh, I was born in Arcadia, and then I and I grew up in Hacienda Heights, which is kind of between um, L.A. and um, and Orange County. And so, and I um, was always into clothing. I always liked clothing. I don't know why. From an early age, I used to iron my own shirts and everything else. My mom would bring my shirts up, and I'd re-iron them. Mom, where's the iron? And so, I was into it um, from an early age. So you don't really know where you originally got the. No, I just like clothing, and yeah. I never studied fashion. I just... Did your parents have a good fashion sense? No. My dad was a contractor, kind of a just normal guy, a developer, super successful guy, but just didn't really care about clothes. And my mom was housewife and 
um, ran the whole house. Yeah. Amazing. Woman. As we do. That's right. Amazing woman. And anyway, so I um, just like clothing and. Where'd you go to high school? Went to Los Altos High School. I got best dressed in high school my senior Woo-hoo. year. That's right. So no doubt. So that was my calling. I said, "Hey, okay, maybe I'll be in the clothing business." See, anyway. no, that worked out but, great. Yeah, but anyway, but then I, um, my upbringing was, I worked in construction really, so I wasn't in the fashion part mm-hmm. of that and, um, development construction. My dad had a financial um, institution and uh, um, hotels and restaurants and things. Successful guy. And I, we used to work in all the businesses. Mainly, I worked in construction. And then I was a waiter in one of his restaurants through uh, college. And then... Um, Taught you a little on the customer service side. Yeah. And when I, I got out of college, my dad said, okay, so where do you want to work? You want to work in finance? You want to work in construction, development? You want to work in the hotels? What do you want to do? And I said, dad, I think I want to open a clothing store. And he said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. Go talk to my tailor. <laughs> so I went to lunch with his tailor. And um, I, I came out of that lunch working for his tailor. Wow. I said, Dad, I'm going to work with Gary. And he's like, oh, my God. It's like that bad fuck. Bad yeah, exactly. Fired. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, it... it um, but, but you never thought to go to fashion school. Because nope. I, I went to FITM, and it seems like that's like the path that a lot of FIT or something. But you didn't go to fashion no, school. I went through training with Gary, and he taught me how to, you know, measure. And he taught me about quality fabrics. And I took several trips to like Huddersfield, England, and Biella, Italy, and Torino, Italy, and Lake Como for tie making. And I did that knocking on doors and just kind of like, you know, stumbling through it, kind of Columbo and through the thing. And um, I really ended up um, really loving the business. Mm-hmm. And I and I really wanted to only do quality, like high-end quality mm-hmm. clothing. And so from an early age, in the early age in the, in the clothing business, um, I started only carrying the nicer fabrics, which was a, a it, it's a barrier to entry because it's much more expensive. Mm-hmm. And people are, a lot of times when you're starting out there, you fall back and a crutch is price. And so people are like, okay, well, and they grind you down on price a lot of times. Like, oh, I want, oh this is all I want to pay. And if you don't stick to your guns and say, no, this is, quality is better than price. It's more important than price. At, well, it's, at, it's kind at of a teaching level. aspect though yes. too, right? right? Especially for men. A lot of them, they just don't understand. Education. Yeah, You have to educate people and educate men are, are, they want to be educated, I think, but they you have to know how to educate them and get their attention and have them really listen. Yeah. So you got your degree in psychology from ASU. That's right. That's right. And do you think that minor you're... Minor in business. Minor in business. Do you think that that psychology degree has helped you with your clients? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a people person, though, I think. I mean, I, I think I am. I'm, you know, I like, I like to... Um, I like to get to know the people. Yeah. And so I think that it's all about... I'm a big fan of communication. That's, it's a, it's a big deal in my life. And so I think that, um, so many things can be, uh, any issues can be prevented by properly communicating up front. It's so true. And that's another thing that's not usually endemic with men. (laughs) There you go. Us women tend to hold those cards, don't they? (laughs) Yes. All right. So, David, we do a little something called big questions here. Uh Uh-oh. This is where we do the deep dive. We really find out everything that makes you tick. Um, Do you have any consistent daily routines? Um, Yeah. I mean, I think I get up in the morning early, 5, 5.30, uh, get my kids up and going because uh, two of my – I have twin boys and they're in basketball and they get up at – 5 a.m. to go to basketball practice, like on a daily basis. What are they, like so, 11, 12? They're 16. 16. Oh 16, gosh. I know, right? Isn't it funny how other people's kids grow up so know, quick? So Your own go oh really God, slowly. How did that, but... how did that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so get them up and going. And they are they have their own cars now, which is amazing. It's wow. the greatest thing ever. Yeah, best thing happened uh, to you. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but get them up, get them going. And then I always uh, go into the kitchen and I trim my coffee my machine on, which is my favorite thing in the morning to do. Do you have a favorite? Machine or coffee? Both. Uh, Jura. Uh, Jura machine, which is amazing. Yeah. And it's, a, it's like, it's a technical wonder, of, you know. And do you need an advanced degree to operate it? I thought I did when I first got it. I was like, wow, deer in the headlights. Yeah. But I now I have my own buttons programmed in there. And so it's my David special, you know, okay. whatever. And so, but I sit there, I stand in the kitchen. Even as, even your coffee's custom. Look at that. <laughs> That's right. I love it because I have a beautiful view from where I live. Amazing ocean view. And I stand in the kitchen. I don't even sit down. I stand and I drink my coffee and I 
check my texts and I drink. And I do a lot of business on the East Coast and in Europe. And so they're way ahead of us in yeah. time. And so that time of the day is my special time. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, kids are gone. They're up and, and going, or at least going. And then I get out there and I do my thing. And it's, I, I really, really, really enjoy that time. Yay. What about exercise? Are you an exercise, exercise guy? I just built a new gym in my home because the kids are at an wow. age where they really into it. So, um, and yeah, I used to work out on the beach with my trainer and that was great. Except for during the winter on the beach, it's very cold mm, and dark yeah. and at an early, you know, five o'clock in the morning is not a great time to work out during the winter on the beach. Um, but so yeah, I do a, a routine probably, I, I do, I have a Peloton bike and I have um, a full weight room set up and it's really great. And so I do, you know, half hour to an hour, maybe three or four days a week. It's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. And then I also, I, I, I run pretty fast. And so in the sense of my daily routine. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of a workout. In You're itself. a high energy person. Yeah. A lot of steps, mm-hmm. you know, during the day, a lot of steps. So tell me something people would be surprised to know about you. Uh, I just got engaged. Congratulations. Woo-hoo. Are we breaking the news here? There you go. Yeah. Dang. Yeah, kind of. yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, yeah, Sonia's so, uh, a beautiful girl, so I'm very excited for you. Yeah. She's amazing. I always tell people, go, oh, you know, there's this mixed reaction at my age getting engaged and getting remarried. And I said, you know, and I've been married twice before. Mm. To, third time's know, a charm. I say third time's a charm or three strikes and you're out. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully it's the first. Yeah. Right. So, but I'm excited about it. And, um, you know, it's a, I'm a one woman guy. I, that's how I am. Mm-hmm. I like, I, I go to work and I come home. Yeah. I'm not a guy's night out guy. Mm-hmm. I've never been that guy. Mm-hmm. And so, and I, and when I go out, I, I like to go out with friends and, and couples. And so, uh, that's it. Perfect. Works out nicely. There you go. I'm so excited for you. Thank you. Um, what books have influenced you the most? The Bible. I don't read a lot of books. I read a lot of periodicals and I'm always, I'm, you know, Wall Street Journal and a lot of magazines and, and uh, newspapers. And I, I, I'm really into like the current events of life and what's going on in all different aspects of life. And so, um, but I read the Bible from cover to cover now. And I really, at first it was- That might like, be something people are surprised to know about you. Right, that's true. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty, it's cool when you get to the end of it, you're like, wow, that was awesome. Yeah. And you really learn a lot about life. You're reading the Bible. Awesome. It's really great. And you had mentioned to me earlier that you do um, daily affirmations. I do daily affirmations. Yeah. I read daily affirmation every single day, 365 days a year. And it starts my day off. That's part of the, my starting um, routine, actually. So is that so, is that from a specific book or where do you get the affirmations from? It's, it's called The Guide. Uh, it's You know what? Here's the funny part about that book. I don't even really know the name of the book anymore <laughs> because it's worn off the off the cover. Oh and so I've been gosh. reading it, the same book. My parents gave it to me, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. And I have the same book and I read it. And so from just me reading it, the, the entire cover is kind of eroded off of that. It's not, it still has a cover, but the actual, there's no name on it anymore. <laughs> And so I kind of forgot the, the book. That's how crazy. I'll get it yeah. to you for sure. Yeah. I'll tell you what no. it is, but it's great. I think it everybody's going to be like, what is that? Yeah. It's cool. Oh, I, I can think of it here. Anyway, I'll think of it in a second here and tell you. So coming out of 2020 experiences, which is what I like to call it now, oh. um, what, what do you think are some of the biggest issues facing our, our world today? Um, like I said earlier, communicating. I think communication is communication is off. You know, everybody is like so far apart now. It's like yeah. polarized on either end. So true. And I think that that's a big deal. I also think wearing masks is a is a tough thing for people because yeah. you can't see the per- the person. You can't see, and it sounds kind of like a a small thing, but I think it. We need to get rid of the masks. Yeah, facial expressions are facial a big part of our communication. Facial expressions are super important to, to see people. And you know, everywhere you're going, if people are so it it takes you out of out of um, out of your normal game. I think it, it's not, it doesn't make life normal how we, you know, have known in the past. So hopefully if we can get past all that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you, you're an international person. I mean, you have clients all over the world. You're constantly traveling, um, always on a plane. So I'm sure that you see a lot I need my of own that. Plane. Well, there you go. Getting there. We'll get there. <laughs> Coming up next. Yep. Um, tell me something that you used to believe, but you don't anymore. Oh, I used to believe that, I'll just say something funny about this. 
point to points on suits should be as big as you can possibly get them. And now they're tailored. <laughs> so no, not, I don't believe that anymore. I think tailored is better than big. It used to be multiple pleats. I mean, uh, point to points and pleats, more pleats, the better. No, all kidding aside. I think that I used, to, what I used to believe that I don't believe any longer. That's a tough question because I think that I used to believe that people are, they, they really want to help everybody. I used to believe, really truly believe that everybody wants to help everybody. And I think that because people have become so polarized apart that they don't, they become much more selfish. Mm. And so I don't think that people really have everyone's best interest in mind as much as they used to. And I don't like that. I wish they would go back to the other. Yeah. But you lead by example. You're one of the most generous people I've ever met. Always Very affable, very gracious, positive. Try so you just have to lead by Thank example, you. right? That. Yeah, lead by example. And I think I do that on a daily basis. I'm, I'm, you know, I never ask anyone to do this, something I wouldn't do. And I don't think I've ever heard of anybody that doesn't love you. Oh, Seriously, thank you. you have a great reputation for sure. Maybe my two exes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure Actually, they do I, too. I like my two exes too. They're great. Yeah, I'm sure awesome. they do. Absolutely. Uh, tell me a goal that you have yet to reach. Oh, I think I'm, um, I'm always trying to teach. And I think that I haven't taught enough people what I know and what I think I, I can uh, give back to. Um, and uh, raising my children to a, um, a point, I think you're, you always raise your children. I think yeah. you're always, you're a, um, a guiding light for your children. And I think that I haven't achieved what I want to achieve in that area yet. And I'm still there. I have great kids. I'm an amazing, amazing. So I think that that's going to be a, a work in process, but there is a goal of having them, uh, become teachers of their own. Do you, do you see your children following into the family business? They say they want to. I keep on advising them against it, but no, I think, I think that my older daughter, she works with me and she is starting her own women's clothing business now, wow, which is launching like exciting. Right now. Is she still in New York? She's in New York. She lives in New York. She and her boyfriend live there and she has been working diligently for the last couple of years on this new business and it's launching right now. Blaze Caprice. Anyway, what is it called? Blaze Caprice. That's her uh, first and middle name. Oh, awesome. And I wonder where amazing, she got that idea know, from. <laughs> right? It's amazing. It's an amazing line of women's clothing and it's going to be super chic and super cool. And um, so watch out for that. Like now. It's great. Very cool. Then, How like, will she plan on distributing? She is going to be, you know, online at first and also through David August. So that's where I can actually offer that to my clients' wives, which I get asked all the time. Right. And so it's a, it's really a good uh, collaboration that we have going. And so it's going to be refreshing for me to be able to say, oh yeah, I can do that for you. And here it is. And her, her, um, the depth of her, of her clothing in the line is amazing. And it's very, very wearable, very elegant, very classic and super high quality. She, I think she has that gene that in her, that she wants quality and she wants it to be the right before she, um, makes it available to her clientele. Yeah. D is there somebody that it's you would liken it to or a designer that you would? Um, it's probably a, a mix of like Dior mm. and um, maybe, uh, I, I think, Valentino and Dior. Oh, wow. So is it, is it more like uh, formal wear? It's or? No, there is. She has, she has a tuxedo jacket and a tuxedo dress. Ooh. Wrap dress. It is mm. hot, hot, Oh, my hot, hot. gosh. Super sexy. We need, we need to talk. And then she has these silk outfits that are um, pant sets that are, and she has shorts for summer out of these, like, four, um, uh, 40 mummy beautiful silks in all these different colors. And she has the shorts, pants, a tapered pant, and then a belt, like a um, um, bootleg type of a pant. It's beautiful. And these great tops. Almost looks like a pajama set, but not a pajama set. So she's going to, uh, sorry I said that, honey. But... <laughs> Not she, pajamas, yeah. dad. She had it photographed in, in, uh, she made sure she had it photographed in heels and in tennis shoes. And she doesn't want people to think that it's, uh, but it's a very high end, high end. Yeah. beautiful. They're beautiful. So I'm very excited for it's her. It's so funny how tennis shoes have become like such a go-to shoe yeah. for women now. I've Everybody never been a tennis really. shoe wearer, but I'm starting to think I better get some pairs. No, they're great. Tennis shoes are great. And there's so many options available in tennis shoes now. I mean, you know, it used to be tennis shoes were, you know, under hundred bucks. And now you oh, can't no. find a good tennis shoe for under 500 bucks. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. Yeah. But you know, I think it's great. And then my two sons, both one, I keep on telling, you know, since I was in the uh, real estate development and construction business from an early age, I keep on saying that's where your 
that's where I also made a lot of my success investments or in real estate. And so I've always told them, you need to get into real estate. You should be in real estate. And so I say, what we'll do is we'll do real estate and you can run David August and you do real estate. We'll have something together. We do two different businesses. You run them both. And so I think that's, if you ask them right now, they'd say, yeah, we're going to get in my dad's business and we're going to do real estate. Wow. That's very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It's nice to have a dad to show you the ropes for sure. It's fun. And I enjoy it. So tell me, what are some of the designers that have influenced you the most? Valentino. Mm -hmm. um, probably one of my favorites. And, and Dior, I love Dior too, even though it's mostly a women's line. But I mean, they have men's also. I just like, um, you know, beautiful lines and, and clothing. And so I, from an early age, I think Valentino was probably the, the um, kind of my focus. Yeah. I wanted to do stuff that was in keeping with that quality. Any young designers, anybody new that you've got your eye on or think they're doing great um, stuff? I would say, well, you know, what's interesting to me is that I actually make clothing for designers too. Mm. Their own personal clothing. Wow. Yeah, like Isaac Mizrahi, I make all of his clothing. Calvin Klein, I make all of his clothing. And oh so, my gosh. Yeah, so it's a, it's been interesting um, that... That would be something can, people wouldn't know about you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say that. Yeah, uh, no, no, that's no, cool. But their personal clothing... Um, is important to them too. And, yeah. and it's like you asked me earlier, do I wear only my own clothing? Same thing with them. They don't, they don't always wear their own clothing. Right. Um, but younger designers, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, up and coming designers. It it's, I'm, escapes me right now, the names of people. But yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of streetwear looking clothing out there that I really don't, I think that's where I'm trying to gain more appreciation for that. Things are I, getting much more casual. I think they're getting casual this is a great conversation to have though, because things are getting more casual and yeah, it's because of certain things, how we've been living our lives yeah. recently. But I also, in conversations on a daily basis I have with, with friends and clients, they're getting tired of dressing down. Mm -hmm. They want to dress up. Yeah. They want to throw a jacket on. They want to throw a sporker. They want to throw a suit on. And I went to dinner last night with some friends and everybody was dressed. One guy showed up in a brand new, beautiful suit, open collared, but when they walked in, the other guy had a beautiful sport coat on. And I okay, just, they know they're going to dinner with David Heil. Well, so they're no, probably think, putting on their A game. You know what? Uh, I don't know, but maybe. But I, I want to give more credit than that. I think that they are dressers and they were going out. Yeah. And so, um, and by the way, we had a great looking crew. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm sure you always I loved do. It. So, I mean, coming out of this 2020 experience, do you think that, um, I mean, Fewer and fewer industries are requiring a more formal attire. And I almost wonder if, like, we're going to start seeing, like, bankers not have to wear suits anymore. Or, But you think that we're, we're going to see it, it come back? Well, I think that, yeah, it has gotten much more casual. I have a lot of investment bankers in New York and hedge fund guys and whatever. And they used to always wear suits to work. Those guys have now been wearing a pair of chinos or slacks, and a button-down shirt, and maybe a vest, like a, a casual kind of parka vest. And that's become kind of the um, the uniform in New York right now, mm. for these younger guys. And But they still are wearing, they still have clothing in their closet. And I think that the way that people are dressing nowadays is so much different than the way they used to dress. They used to wear a lot of business suits and things. And I, I think the, the business suit has kind of gone by the wayside in most um, areas. Yeah. And, and so they still dress, but they dress for um, for events. Mm. And they dress up a little bit more. It's, it's much more thought out than just a basic uniform. So I think it's coming back. And and men's men's fashion, we don't see the same big, you know, trend swings that we see in, in women's fashion, right? No. So uh, men have always kind of... Is there anything that you wish you would see come back into men's fashion? Um, I, I think that... Um, I, I kind of like a little bit fuller cut, not like big suits, mm -hmm. but more comfort. I think that... Um, it got to a point where everything was so skinny mm -hmm. in the last few years, people were in tight, everything tight, tailor, tailor, tailor. Yeah. And I think that it's, it accentuates a good part of a body. And I think it's great, but I think that coming back into a little bit more relaxed, not big pleats or big shoulders or anything like that, but just something that's more relaxed and more comfortable that looks more age appropriate for the person that they're, that the, the age that the person is at that time in their lives. Is there anything men should just absolutely not wear anymore? Take it out of your closet. I don't want to mention names, but big, floral, crazy bowling shirts. By some <laughs> company. 
don't want to talk okay, about it. Yeah. Anyway, I always when I see these in their closet, these these shirts are like you know Hawaiian shirts and stuff. Yeah. And some can be fun, but um, there's a, a certain company that again I'm not gonna mention a certain company that was very popular. Yeah. And it, and it just gangbusters and everybody had this in their closet. Yeah. Like that's all they had. Well, in, in Newport Beach, they did. Yeah, all, actually, Newport Beach for sure, but all over. It's amazing. Really? Yeah, you go in people's closets. I was like, wow. Okay, don't ever wear one of those shirts again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, they're not even really cut very well either. They're, they're so they're boxy. A, and It's just boxy yeah. and it just and they get names written all over them. And they're just, it's too much. Yeah. Too much. I've so. never been a big fan of men in khakis. Yeah. I, it's I, just like really, it's just so unflattering in my opinion. I just think, you know, um, there's a thing that, to me, in my mind, you see two people, two guys walk into a, a room, into a restaurant or into a bar or into a wherever. They're walking in and one guy is wearing um, a suit. And then one guy's wearing a pair of chinos or khakis and a polo shirt. Who do you look at first? You always look at the guy in the suit. For always. Sure. 100% people yes. go, wow, that guy, even though he's out of, he might be out of place, they look at the guy in the suit and the respect is for the guy in the suit. Right. It's weird. It's just this thing. Even though... The guy in the suit might be working for the guy in the polo shirt. Yeah. But you still look at the guy in the suit first. So I think that you need to take that and kind of digest that. People need to understand that it's important Yeah. to always, you know, kind of dress it up a little bit. You can always take your jacket off, but you can't show up to a party or a function or whatever it might be in a pair of chinos and a polo shirt and everybody's wearing a jacket and now you're total fish out of water. Right. So I think it's but always better. I think better people are very, very um, forgiving with men's fashion. You know, like we kind of just accept whatever guys are going to wear. They're, a lot of times they're they're dressed way more casually than women are. Right. Um, That's true. But I'm sure that doesn't happen to you. But Well, it does. And I think that um, more and more people are even um, I have a lot of my clients, kids that are now at an age where they're starting to dress and they really like wearing suits and sport yeah. coats. It's amazing. It's really refreshing. Yeah. And they're really into it. And, they, and I think that people are more educated nowadays on it. So I think... At, at in a certain area, a certain time when people didn't really care as much, it was just like, oh, who cares? I'm just wearing a pair of pants and a shirt. Who cares? And the women dress up more. I think that's kind of going away because people are becoming more educated. Yeah. yeah. So my um, so my nephew Cedric worked with you yep. for, for Cedric, a while, and um, so when he moved into his next iteration, he and my son started working together. So he gave my son a couple of the, the suits that he had from working with you. Right. And it, he looked so flawless in these suits. And I think it really helped my son with, when he was starting out in his career to have some really nice clothes, because I think people looked at him and he was so young already, right. fresh out of college. Right. And when he would walk in, he'd say, mom, people Confidence. Always, yeah. It helped build his confidence, and it also gave the people around him confidence that he knew what he was doing. Because obviously, if you're dressing this well, you must have some kind of acumen behind you. That, that's so, amazing. Yeah. That's one of our our uh, our foundation principles is that we instill co we instill confidence in people by you know, having given them a sense of power and not overpowering people, but having that sense of wow, okay. Um, I feel I'm not thinking about oh am I underdressed or I'm am I, am I am I not qualified or I'm not it because when they when you put a beautiful clothing item on it gives you this you know burst of energy in a great way and it makes you feel like you can do anything. Yeah. So we we are instilling confidence in people. I really love that. And men don't have all the different things that women have. I mean, women have makeup and we've got yeah. all these accessories and we've got all this extra stuff we can do. I mean, when it comes to men, it's like how you cut your hair and what you wear, right? That's it's like it really it. comes down to very cut simple things. Yeah. So putting a little extra time into yeah. how 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 you dress, I think, is really pays off for men. How important is is the the woman's role in a man's uh, attire? It, well, I think that, you know, they have to how look at you. How can we help? Yeah. They have to, <laughs> women have to look at you. So you have to, you know, they want you to, you want to, Make sure that you're um, dressing for your woman. I think yeah. I think it's important, and I think that women are. What we're trying to do is take the negative side out of uh, dressing for that relationship. By we organize it, we um, we number everything in the guy's wardrobe. We put it into a wardrobe book. It's kind of like groundables for adults. So what does that mean, numbering? So all the suits are numbered from one to whatever. All the sport coats numbered from one to whatever. All the shirts one to whatever. Everything has a number in it, sewn in the garment. 
And so, and then we put it into a wardrobe book and we say, okay, suit number seven goes with shirt number 12, tie number 15, black shoe, black belt, black sock. This is a big part of the process you dr- you missed out on last like, time. I'm sorry that process. <laughs> we didn't finish that. But yeah, so we number every item and it's a wardrobe management system that it really helps in the relationship because yeah. it takes away the, hey, honey, does this match? What about right. the women? Like, yeah, yeah, it looks good. But it allows the women to still be involved in the buying process, which that's the fun part. Yeah. Making out the fabrics, all yeah. that kind of stuff. But the management part of it, that's what they get tired of. And that's what people get testy about, mm. arguments about. So we take that away from the relationship and we instill this amazing wardrobe and how it should be worn. And, and it helps in like somebody's getting ready to go to an event and they, oh my God, what do I wear? It's the invitation says garden chic. What does garden chic mean? They text me or text or call the office and say, oh my God, I'm going to this thing. What should I wear? The invitation says garden chic. What is that? And then, <laughs> you know, so, pick out suit 12, shirt seven. Yeah, yeah. I usually say, don't go to that party because <laughs> that's a stupid name. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but well, California chic yeah, is California what we hear. Chic, or coastal yeah. chic coastal is something chic, we hear. But like, yeah. garden these, all these chic. things, yeah, whatever. It's, so we go to the wardrobe on the computer, and we have a file on it on every client. And I'll say, hey, you know, go to. I'll give them two choices or whatever. I say for that event, you should probably wear it. find out when the event is, what time of day it is, evening event, outdoor event, what is it. Find that information out, and then we can go to the wardrobe and say, hey, I suggest you wear coat number two with pant number four, open collar. Do they really call nine. you with these questions all the time? Oh my gosh, Everybody. you are full service. Yeah, I get texts all the time. My gosh, all that's incredible. And I get people, clients, take a picture of themselves in the outfit and send it to them and they go, you know, uh, Rock and David August. Wow. It's fun. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and they're proud of it. And they're they're actually, it's a release for these guys that they normally wouldn't have. And, they, and most guys, if you ask them, would they do that? They'd say, I would never do that. But they do. You know what? You should have like a blog thing on your website so the guys can like post their pictures of their outfits. That would would be so cute. They would do it. You'd be surprised. I mean, I'm surprised that that um, how into it the guys are. And by the way, when you tell people about that numbering system, when Mm -hmm. we first meet and we're going through the process, um, they don't care. They're like, yeah, yeah, well, I'll never use it. I don't need that. I'm fine. I'm good. But I do it anyway. And what ends up happening after you're with a client, working with a client for a year or two years, sometimes three years takes a certain amount of time. They get to a point where they have so much clothing in their closet, you know, that they're not sure, but they walk in, they go, oh my God, how do you say to wear this? And so they'll come back and they say, hey, you know that numbering system thing you were telling me about yeah. two years ago? Do you still do that? And I'm like, yeah, here's your book. And I send them pictures. We take photographs of all the garments on a mannequin, mm-hmm. all the outfits. And so, um, and then we send them a JPEG on that and they can put it on their computer or on their phone or whatever. I love that. That's great. That is super cool. Yeah. And so when you do the initial, initial consultations, do you encourage the wives to be there or you don't really care or how? You know what? I, I, I would encourage them, yes, but it's it doesn't really, it's not necessary. I mean, you don't need them, but maybe no. it would be helpful for them to understand the I like the, the women to be involved if they can. It's always nice to have the women involved. Yeah. It's nice. I mean, especially if they're pro, what they're doing sometimes, you know, in any situation, they could also undermine the appointment a little bit right. at times if they're not into it. And so... I like to get them involved because I think it's important that they communicate in that area. Tell me about Miracle for Kids. Miracles for Kids. I happen to know that's a charity foundation that you've spent a lot of time and energy to helping to develop. Yeah, it's a, that is, it's a, I've been on the board of Miracles for Kids for like 13 years now, going wow. on 13 years, a long time. <laughs> and I uh, just, I literally, um, I was asked to be on this board and I told Curtis Green, one of the founders of Miracles for Kids, Autumn Stryer and, and Curtis are co-founders. And he asked me to be on the board and I said, oh, I'd rather donate. Yeah. And he said, well, actually, that's not what happened. Actually, he asked me to go to his event. I went to his event in Fashion Island at the old Twin Palms right. there. Yeah, I was at that event. Yep. And and uh, the next day he called me and said, what did you think about our event? And I said, that oh, was pretty good, pretty good. And he said, well, what would you do differently? I said, well, look, I go to a lot of these events. Yeah. And they're usually, you know, four or 500 people at a time. Mm-hmm. I said, well, how much did you guys raise? And he told me they raised you know, about a hundred grand. I think it was 113,000, whatever. I go, oh, he goes, well, what would you do differently? I said, well, here's the deal. I firmly believe that in every community, every city, that there's a handful of connectors, okay? And those connectors... 
if you don't have those connectors involved in your program, at least one of those connectors or two, it's not going to be as successful as it could be if you, uh, if you did have those people involved. Mm -hmm. And I said, at your event, I didn't see any connectors. I said, I can consider myself a connector, but mm -hmm. I think, and a connector is not the wealthiest guy in town or a woman right. in town. It's the concierge. It's the mm -hmm. hotel manager, the restaurant owner. It could be a, a successful person. It depends who the connectors are, the people that get involved in the yeah. community. Okay. And the people know. And it takes those people to make your event more, more... Well, and it's also people who can drive people to your event. <clears throat> well, that's the same thing. Right. Exactly what I'm trying to say. Right. Exactly. Drive people to your event and get people involved. And so I didn't see any connectors there except for I felt like I was a connector. And so he said, oh. And I said, and, I, and how much do you charge for tickets? He told me. I said, I think you need to raise your ticket prices. And he said, wow, you know, it's so hard already. And he said, well, why don't you join the board? And I said, oh, I'd rather donate. And he said, come on, you can do it. Why don't you join the board? And I said, look, I'll join the board if... You get this person, this person to join also. And if you raise your ticket prices and you change your venue, I'll join the board. And he's like, oh man. So a couple of days later, he comes back, comes back to me. He said, okay, done. <laughs> Got the other two people to join. We're changing the venue to the Montage in Laguna Beach. And we're going to raise the ticket prices. I said, great. And so um, we started that first um, event at the Montage after the moving and we were falling flat because we'd raise our ticket prices more than double the ticket prices. And people, we had an emergency last minute meeting, like three weeks before the event. <clears throat> we weren't selling tickets like we were supposed to. We were invited. They're like, thanks, they, David. Yeah. Great so idea. They were all freaking out. And they said, our main uh, supporters are um, upset because they think we're spending all of our money on this big hotel. And, you know, the we're wasting the money should be going towards the children. And I said, look, and we and they were trying to get it switched back to maybe the Newport Beach Yacht Club or something, make it a smaller event and uh, lower the ticket prices again to get more people involved. And I said, okay, everybody just freeze. Hold on a second. I said, everybody, we got to stick with the program. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. We're going to sell this thing out. And they're like, oh my God. And I go, have a leap of faith. You got to do it. Let's go. And so everybody break, go. I got back in my car. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> dialing so, for dollars dialing for dollars so that's what i did yeah and we uh raised 600 grand wow great. awesome and then since then it's been off the races honestly autumn stryer i'm sure you know her she's of course i know Autumn. amazing yeah she, she's amazing and she is uh a driving force and yeah, so now sure. we're, we're you know raising a couple million dollars each for each event yeah and no, it's been amazing we have all these different programs and so it's really it usually always seems like your table making the most money. <laughs> We're trying. Well, I, got, I think that's why I, they do all the work. Yeah. I, my, my job is to be the connector. The money connect. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what they look towards me for. But, um, but, I, but about Miracles for Kids, really what it's about is we're helping these families with critically ill children. Yeah. And we help um, approximately um, 250 families a year from Orange County and LA and um, these, these kids. And we lose children. It's horrible. But at the same time, we're fighting the fight on a daily basis. And uh, they need us. And these they are um, below the poverty level. Most of the families that apply for grants from us, we take care of their you know, hospital bills, their car payments, their rent, their groceries, different things. And uh, it's a beautiful charity. <laughs> it's, it's a great event every year. And I am just so appreciative for what you do, because I'm always Thank there. You. And I always see you. It's just, a big party. Yeah, it's a great party. Okay, so before I let you go, I have to ask you about the new uh, Connor August August McGregor. McGregor. August McGregor. We have a new line that's uh, that it's actually a couple of years old now, but we started that kind of like on a shoestring. We said, "Hey, it's a it's a line that we created." Connor's been a client of mine since he came into the UFC. He's been an MMA fighter for years, and um, when I started making clothing for him when he first joined the UFC, um, we hit it off really well, and. And he's a dapper guy and he wears his clothing great and everybody loves how he dresses. He's be he's become this clothing iconic dresser. Mm. And people really look to him for fashion. It's a, he's like a David Beckham, it's a Conor McGregor. And and they're all, um, you know, Brad Pitt, George Clooney, they're all very, very into uh, the, uh, the fashion look. So anyway, started this. I said, look, let's start a line together to give back to his client base. He has a 40 million follower client, I mean, uh, Instagram following. And these people uh, always want a piece of Conor McGregor. And I said, let's create a line that represents what you wear and your lifestyle, my lifestyle together. And let's give back to them at a affordable price. 
And so that's what we did. We created this collection, suitings. You, instead of spending four or five, six thousand dollars for a suit, you can get a suit for six hundred to eight hundred dollars. And it's not the same quality, but it's the same Various look. Clients suit wearers. <laughs> Some are not really. No, not really. Yeah. And so what we found is that they want a piece of him for you know these guys are people that make um, you know minimum wage and so but there are people that they can afford the um, more expensive suits too. Yeah. But the majority of them are guys that just want to have be involved in Connor's life and yeah. and so we do t-shirts and hoodies and track suits and beanies and baseball caps and cool suits and jackets and bomber jackets. We do everything, complete yeah. collection. And it's an awesome collection. And we do, he's got these famous quotes. You know, they say, hey, you know, Connor, you look great. You know, what's going on this week? You're going to fight this weekend? He goes, yeah. He goes, I like to whoop ass and look good. You know, that type <laughs> of thing. So we put that on, it says, August McGregor, whoop ass and look good. Yeah. And people love it. It's on a hoodie. And it's, and it's amazing. You put that online. I never sold anything online before. And it's an amazing like energy. Yeah. And it really goes. So we're building this business and and we also have that FU collection that we did with his FU. So we have, um, I did these boxer briefs. Actually, I brought some for you today. Some women's Woo-hoo! boxer briefs. The FU Sorry. pattern on it and Yay. the men's boxer briefs. And we do a lot of that stuff. So it's a great collection and it's a great partnership, great collaboration. Wonderful. We're having fun with it. Yay. Yeah. So if people want to work with you. How do they find you? Uh, you can go online. It's David, are you, are you, David. Do you still have time for people? <laughs> uh, you know what? Yes, I do. I always have time. New yeah. business. I love that. I love meeting people. And, you know, I don't have as much time as I used to have, but I... Well, you've got a great team. we got an amazing, I, I know amazing you have an incredible staff, team. team. And they're they're amazing. And people think that our business, oh, you're in the clothing business. And so, you know, oh, fashion, that's easy to do. I'd love to join. Mm-mm. It's not like that. Our business is very... It is like that at a point. But behind the curtain... It's a technical business and it's very, we have so many moving parts in our business and people don't understand that until they get in and they're like, wow, I can't, and it takes people, people go, oh, just train me and I'll, I'll, you know, hit the ground running and take me a couple of weeks to do it. I go, look, that's, I appreciate that. And that's great. Mm-hmm. And if they have the same values that we have, we try to get them involved in the business, but I try to prepare people for an emotional situation while they're in a rational state of mind. I do that all the time. And I'm telling them, look, when you get hired at David August, it's going to take you possibly two years to get like up to speed. What? Two years? Are you kidding me? Maybe longer. You're always learning because it's such a fast moving business, technical business. There's so many moving parts. Um, Just to order a custom hand tailored shirt, you've got to take measurements put them in, get to know how to put them in the system, design the shirt, order the fabric, it goes from the fabric vendor to the to our shop, from our shop to our um, quality control shop, measure it all out, press it, make an appointment, go fit the client, bring it back in for alterations possibly, wow. go back out. I mean, it's just, there's all, it's like a wheel with a bunch mm-hmm. of spokes on it. And so um, it's it's uh, very technical. So a lot yeah. A lot harder than people Well, thank think. God you're there doing it because... We're trying. Who We're else trying. would you go to? Yeah, so David, thank you so much for being a guest today. Thank you for I having so me. I really appreciate it. There. Love seeing it's you. It's been amazing. You're awesome. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you for listening to this episode of Delphine Circle. If you enjoyed the episode, please check out our last two. And remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Delphine. Welcome to my circle. <laughs>